All right. I just want to read for us from Proverbs 18, verse 21, a very familiar verse of scripture, and then we're going to rise up and make our declaration. Proverbs 18, verse 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. We constantly remind us of this verse and other verses in scripture that talk to us about the power of the tongue. The death and life are in the power of our tongue. Our words carry a huge impact. Death and life. So our words either produce life or they... And God said this in place. No, I'm not making it up. God said it in place. God said death and life are in the power of the tongue. And if you know how to use it rightly, you can enjoy its fruit. And so we encourage all of us. We teach. We train. We, we encourage all of us. You know, speak words. Speak the word of God. Speak words of life. Uh, speak words that build you up. Don't speak words that bring death and doom and destruction. Speak life in every situation. Speak the word of God. Because you know that your words can bring either death or life. For yourself. For people around you. For your home, your family, your children, speak words that bring life, that bring strength, uh, that bring encouragement. Because that's the power that God has placed in our words. So what we do every Sunday, or most Sundays, is we stand up and we make our declaration. So let's do that right now. If you brought your Bible with you, hold it high up in the air and let's together make our declaration loud, bold, and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive his word, I believe his word, and I live by his word. Christ is my master, and to him I am in absolute surrender. I advance boldly to take new ground, to extend God's kingdom. I have kingdom power and authority vested in me. The powers of darkness... Cannot hold me back or pin me down. The forces of the enemy cannot restrain me or contain me. The greater one is in me. God's power through me is more than what the devil can handle. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Why don't you turn around to people next to you? Shake hands, smile, say hello. Give them your name. Smile at them. You may be seated. Please. Right after the service this morning, we have our water baptism service uh, immediately uh, at the close of this service. So those of you who have come prepared, uh, please head towards the swimming pool. Uh, it's on the side of the parking lot. So uh, we'll, we'll have the water baptism service at the swimming pool right after our service, main service here this morning. I want to take a few moments, a uh, few meaning about 30 to 40 minutes, <laughs> uh, just talking to us about enforcing victory. Um, this is actually a continuation of what we heard about two Sundays back when we talked about battle zone and we uh, talked about what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Now we understand, and I'm just going to review a few things and then take this forward. We understand that we are in, a sp in spiritual conflict. There is an enemy, Satan and all of his demons that, uh, that are doing their destructive works. So we are engaged in spiritual conflict. But there is a very important truth that you and I need to be established in. And that is the enemy has already been defeated. 
that the Lord Jesus Christ has already triumphed over Satan and all of his demonic powers. And so we reiterated this statement uh, last time, we will, uh, several times during the sermon, and we will do it again this morning. So let's all say this together. Satan, let's, let's just say it together. Satan and all his demons ha- have been crushed, expelled, condemned, disarmed, and destroyed. Well, we say it one more time. Let's go together. Satan and all his demons have been crushed, expelled, condemned, disarmed, and destroyed. One more time. Satan and all his demons have been crushed, expelled, condemned, disarmed, and destroyed. That's the truth. It's the word of God. Jesus Christ finished this work on the cross. So when you and I uh, uh, deal with wicked spirits, with demons, this is how we approach. We are not contending for victory, but we are operating out of a place of victory. The work is done. Jesus did all the hard work. As as Isaiah 53, 12 says, he shares his spoil with the strong. That means he won the victory. He's sharing that with us. And so we operate or live life out of this finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, But on the other hand, we were... We ask this question, uh, but then why does the enemy seem so powerful? Why does the enemy seem to be able to do, you know, such evil, wicked things? Now, we understand from Scripture, as the Scriptures indicate, that uh, for whatever reason, God has given Satan a period of time on this earth. He has it. So, for instance, you know, when Jesus was casting out demons, uh, uh, you hear them say, Why have you come to torment us before the time? So they know they have a time. They know it. So for whatever reason, he's given them a certain time period here on earth. All right. And so during this time period, they are working havoc. They're doing what they have to do. So we need, it pays for us to understand something about the enemy's strategies. How does he work? So that we can counteract it. And our, and our objective really is to enforce the victory. We're not trying to subdue. He's already subdued. We're trying to keep him subdued. Stay that way. Keep him under our feet. And give him no opportunity uh, to do things in our lives. So we, try, we are trying to understand Satan's game plan. And we talked about his primary way in which he works. And I'm just reviewing what we did two Sundays ago. So Satan's primary way, his game plan, number one strategy is to play mind games. To play mind games. That's his number one strategy. He's disarmed. He really has no great weapon. And so his primary strategy is to play mind games. That means to work through our minds. How does he do it? One is try and blind us or blind people from the truth. That's why the proclamation, the preaching or the teaching of the word of God is so important so that we can get to know the truth. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth. And then that truth that you know is what will set you free. So if you don't know the truth, there's nothing to set us free. So we need to know the truth. And that's why we preach, teach the word. We need to be in the word. Know the truth. Because Satan's primary objective is to keep us from the truth. Even when the word is sown, Jesus said in the parable of the sower, what does the the enemy do? He comes to take, steal that word. That's his first reaction. When people hear the word, his first attempt is to take that word away. Because he does not want that word to get into you and me. Because he knows that word is powerful. So he comes immediately to take what has been sown. So keeps people from knowing the truth. Other mind games he plays is with thoughts and arguments and reasonings and mental strongholds occupying territory in our minds. And and, and using that to control us. For some people it could be fear. 
And some of these fear, fears could be you know, all kinds of things. It could be fear about the future, fear about something bad happening to you, uh, and so on. But that's Satan's strategy. He plays, uses mind games with thoughts and reasoning and arguments. And uh, another way he works is cr using craftiness to deceive. So s deception is a, is a huge operation of the enemy. Now what is deception? Deception can be, you know, twofold. Either you get people to believe a lie as though it was the truth, or to reject truth as though it was a lie. In both cases, deception happens. But Satan is crafty in his deception. It's not straightforward. He's cunning in how he brings about deception in the minds of people. And what does deception do? It weakens us. It corrupts. It weakens us. So when we are deceived, we are in a place of weakness. So this is how he operates. And therefore, we, we men, made mention last time, as Paul uh, admonishes us in Ephesians 4.27, he says, don't give place to the devil. So believe it, that's our responsibility. Don't give place to the devil. Just tell your neighbor, hey neighbor, don't give place to the devil. <laughs> So don't give him an opportunity to work in your life. He will come with his mind games and thoughts and reasonings and arguments and deceptions and, you know, through the mind. But don't give him any opportunity. Don't give him any place. The moment that thought comes, reject it. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You can't prevent the thought from coming, but you can prevent it from landing. <laughs> like they used to say in the old times, you can't prevent the bird from flying over your head, but you can prevent it from making a nest. So, you can't prevent those thoughts. That's, that's his mind game. He plays those games. You can't prevent those thoughts from coming, but you don't have to accept it. Reject it. You recognize it's a wrong thought. It contradicts the word. It's not pleasing to God. Get rid of it. Don't let it even settle in your thinking. So we want to address two more strategies of the enemy very quickly. And then just emphasize this thing that about enforcing victory in our personal lives and when we minister to people. So second strategy that the enemy uses is open doors. Open doors. And really it's not a strategy, but it's something he keeps looking for. And it's something that we do on our part. It's actually a fault on our parts. You know, when, when we go to sleep at night, we make sure we lock all the doors. Main door locked, check. And then you go to sleep. And even if you live in a gated community, you don't leave your door open. Even if you have a security guard standing in front. Because you don't know, they might be the ones coming in, you know. So. so you lock your doors. You secure yourself. Now same thing we have to do in the spiritual. If we leave the doors open, uninvited guests can come in and do damage. Same thing in the spiritual. That we need to guard our lives and the things that concern us. To make sure the enemy doesn't gain access. What are the things that give the enemy access? Sin. Wrong words and situations. So I just want to address some of these very quickly. Sin. Unconfessed. Unrepented sin. Opens the door for the enemy. And when we say sin. It, it could be deeds of commission. Things that you actually do. It could also be attitudes of the heart. Anger, hatred, unforgiveness, strife, jealousy, pride. All these things are also uh, wrong, uh, uh, sinful things that give the enemy open door. Like James chapter 3 says that even st that strife, where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. So just envy and strife. Two brothers, enough to tear down the house. Envy, jealousy, and strife. It says, if you have envy and strife, gone. You have the open door, and there is confusion, and every evil work. So we're not talking about some 
grievous things like, you know, murder and robbery and all. Let's talk about envy and strife. I think about married couples. That gets really serious. If a husband and a wife have envy and strife in operation, we're not talking about murder and stealing. We're talking about envy and just husband and wife. Envy and strife between husband and wife. What happens? The enemy has an open door to work in that family. That's it. I didn't make it up. The Bible says it. Envy and strife. Where there's envy and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. And it can happen in any other scenario. In church, in a team, envy and strife. There is confusion and every evil. So you've got to guard against this. So sin and, and unrepentant, unconfessed sin opens the door for the enemy to come in and create a work, do what he does. And so some of the sin may be because of our own fleshly weaknesses. So we, our flesh has its weakness. And there's a pull of our own flesh. So we don't have to blame the devil. It's our own flesh pulling us down in that area. And so we need to contend with the flesh and say no to the flesh. And that's where the enemy strikes. He strikes at the weakness of our flesh. And we call that temptation. That are just inducements to sin. He knows, oh, you got a weakness there, you got a weakness there, you got a weakness there. All right, let me just pull on those. That's how temptations come. And so whether it's the weakness of our own flesh, whether it's an inducement, um, as a temptation of the enemy, we must submit to God. We must submit to His Word. We must crucify our flesh with the help of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in Romans 13, it says, make no provision for the flesh. Don't give the flesh even an opportunity. Make no provision. It's like, if you know the fire is going to hurt, don't play with the fire. I just want to see how hot it is. <laughs> Sometimes a little too hot. Too late then. Because you get burnt. So the Bible says, don't even make any provision for the flesh. Don't give it an opportunity, a chance. Make no provision. And stay on guard always. A second way doors open in our lives is to the wrong words. Words, as we saw earlier this morning, are very important. Our words invite God or open the door to the enemy. See, the Bible says, believe in your heart. The Lord Jesus, you confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Salvation in our lives have, has come in. God's saving work comes into our life when we believe and when we confess. If, and, and so your words receive God's work of salvation. You bring it into your life. So your, word can, your words can invite God to come in or your words can invite the enemy to come in. When we speak contrary to the word of God, when we speak contrary to the promises of God, when we speak contrary to uh, what God has spoken to us, we're inviting the enemy to come in. And so what, what should I do? You cancel those words. Sometimes I say something and I like, at that moment I know, okay, I should not have said it. I just say, in Jesus' name, I cancel those words. I reject those words and instead I speak such and such. I speak the word of God. Because I know the power of words. God said it. And if you let wrong words keep coming out of your mouth, it's an opportunity for the enemy to work. Jesus said, by your words, you will be justified. Or by your words, you will be condemned. Our words. And thirdly, the enemy uses situations in life. You see, we all, we all face different situations. And we need to be on guard in all of these situations. Because the enemy is looking for opportunities through those situations. We have to be on guard all the time. Even in times of great triumph. You've, you've, you've achieved something great. You're on, you know, it's another pinnacle of success. You've done something outstanding. And you, you're, you just feel great. But it's also at that time of great triumph that we have the tendency to let our guards down. Because, hey, 
I deserve it. Or in times of great tragedy, when there's great difficulty and trauma or grief or uh, things that are happening, it's also a time of great weakness. Because you're shaken, you're broken, uh, you feel weak, and the enemy uses these situations in life to gain access. And so we need to be on guard all the time. Are you with me? Let's just look at one biblical example on this in, in, in Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, Paul has written to the church in Corinth. Uh, uh, a man in the church has committed sexuality and Paul is uh, guiding them on how to bring correction to him. He says you need to take action. You just can't tolerate that uh, because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little sin will destroy the whole church the whole community so deal with it so the church in Corinth they respond to Paul's letter they take action they discipline the man so Paul hears about it and he writes the second time in second Corinthians this time he's saying I want you to forgive him because he's repented so he writes in second Corinthians we pick up a few verses there in verses 8 through to 11 he says therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him for to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sake in the presence of Christ. So he's saying, look, reaffirm your love for him. This man has repented. Now if you forgive him, it's as good as me forgiving this person. So please do that. And notice what he says in verse 11 in the context of this situation. He says in verse 11, you need to do this. Why? Lest, let's read verse 11 together. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his See, in the context of this situation, how you're handling this situation, do it right. Why? Because Satan might otherwise take advantage of us in the situation. And we're not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of how he operates. So situations in life, we've got to be on guard how we handle things. If we don't handle things rightly, it gives the enemy an opportunity to make inroads. So handle those situations correctly. Are you with me? Some of you are. So just to wake your neighbor up, tell him, think like the devil. <laughs> Seriously, tell them, think like the devil. <laughs> so that brings me to our next point. Where, and please understand the context. You and I need to learn to think like the devil. That means think strategically. And I do this often. Say, Pastor, you think like the devil? Yeah. <laughs> Here's what I do. I try to think in different situations. If I were the enemy, how would I use the situation to attack me? That's what I mean when I say think like the devil. So don't go from here and say, Pastor told us all <laughs> to think like the devil. Here's what I mean. I mean that in different situations, you are on God, but you're also thinking, how would the enemy use the situation to attack me, to make inroads? How would he attempt to do that? You're in a different situation. Maybe you're in a situation of great success. Everybody's applauding you. And you've got to be on guard. Why? Because if you're not careful. You know that lady sitting across you in the office? She keeps applauding you. Every morning, tea break, 11 o'clock. Lunch break, 12.30. Another tea break, 3.30. Another tea break, 5.30. Before you go home. So she's been applauding. Now, you've done a great work. But she applauds you six times every day. When you go home, you get six complaints. And before you know it, the devil says, that lady is better than your wife. Are you listening? Don't pretend this doesn't happen. I mean, this is the enemy's strategy. So you've got to think like the devil. Hey, I better be careful. Because this is what the enemy will do. Yes, you may have done great things. You may, you know, have, you know, done a lot of big things for your company. But be careful of that person sitting in front of you. Otherwise, in your moment of great success... The devil is setting you up for a big fall. 
Are you listening? That's how the enemy works. You've got to think like the devil. What would the enemy do in this situation to try and trip me up? I am putting my defenses up. So you don't let that flattery coming from that person affect you in any way. You just deflect it. You ignore it so that she shuts up. Amen. <laughs> don't let it affect you. The same thing happens in times of grief, in times of trauma. Now you may be going through a really difficult time. You go to work with a very sad face. And that same lady in front of you. <laughs> six times a day. Morning, <laughs> tea break, lunch break. Another tea break. Six times a day she listens to you for five full minutes. And you're able to unburden all your grief. But when you get home, your wife doesn't listen to you for five seconds. She wants you to listen. <laughs> so sooner or later, this thought comes. This lady understands you better than your wife. So you got to be careful. In your moment of great turmoil, the enemy is looking to make inroads. So you got to be on your guard. He uses situations. He uses these kinds of things. Whether you're a great success or great uh, difficulty, be on guard. So think strategically. Think like that. Okay, I need to be on guard. I don't want the enemy to use any of these things in my life. The third um, strategy which uh, the enemy uses, we just considered very briefly, is of course he violates and he intrudes into our lives. He's a trespasser. He does things he's not allowed to do. And Jesus captured it like this in John 10 and verse 10. He said the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So the thief comes. He's a violator. He's an intruder. And he comes to steal, kill, destroy, to take away what is not rightfully his. So that's how it works. And these three things apply to both believers and the unsaved, the non-believers. The big difference is in the life of the non-believer and the life of the person who's not saved, there is no resistance. In fact, there may be a lot of cooperation. With all the mind games, with all the temptations and the, you know, the, the opportunities they provide for the enemy, open doors in their lives for the enemy to work. But in the case of the believer, hopefully there is resistance. Because you know the truth. And the same enemy comes with the same strategies, but you know how to put up your defenses and you know how to resist and subdue. And so that's what we want to talk about in closing. You and I must learn to enforce victory in every area of our life, in our personal life, and when we minister to people. When you recognize the enemy coming in any way, whether it's through the mind games, through those thoughts, the negative thoughts, uh, confusing thoughts, uh, tempting thoughts, when those thoughts come, you need to put up resistance and say, I will not receive that. My Jesus has already conquered those things. Thoughts of fear, you resist it. You resist. And you're not fighting for victory, but you're fighting from a place of victory. So you don't have to be afraid. Oh no, the devil's come again. I'm scared. No, 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 no. Remember that Satan, let's say it out together once again, so that just in case you missed it the first time. Go. Satan and all his demons have been crushed expelled, condemned, disarmed, and destroyed. That's the way you fight. You know this enemy really cannot do much. He's a pretender. He pretends to be like a roaring lion. You know what Jesus Christ has done to him. You know that Jesus has Ex crushed him, expelled him, condemned him, disarmed him, and destroyed him. And so from that mindset, from that point of view, you say, I resist those things. 
If he's coming to intrude in your life. So I resist those things. You and I know these scriptures. In James 4 and verse 7. James says submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee. So we got to put up some resistance. And say no devil. You're not doing this in my life. You are not going to have any place in my mind. In my thinking. No You've got to put up some resistance. You've got to stand against it. To oppose it. You're enforcing the victory that Jesus Christ has obtained for you already. You're enforcing that victory in your life. So whether it's in your marriage. You see the enemy coming to do things. Enforce victory. Say no devil. This is not the place. The house of the righteous will stand God blesses the house of the righteous. In the house of the righteous, there is the voice of rejoicing and salvation. If it's concerning your children, speak the word. So they may be acting up now, but no, you speak the word. It's the devil, you will not have my children. God said in his word, he pours out his spirit upon my seed, his blessing upon my offspring. God said that my children would be mighty on the earth. So you speak that word over your children. Don't let him have his way when it comes to your children. When it comes to your finances, you speak the word. You say, God blesses all the work of my hands. God gives me the power to get wealth. And say, devil, you will not interfere in my finances. When it comes to your workplace, same thing. When you go to work tomorrow morning, you go to work saying, I am highly favored by God. Amen? It doesn't matter my boss or what my colleagues say, I'm highly favored. God surrounds me with favor as with a shield. You walk into your office with your head held up high because his word says, he is my glory and the lifter up of my head. So don't hang your head down. Lift up your head. He's your glory. The lifter up of your head. So walk like that. It's like devil you will not cause confusion in my workplace. You take authority. Now when you see things happening. Uh, in your relationships or in, in your workplace. And, and you know there are wrong things happening. You take authority. You speak to that situation. You say in the name of Jesus I bind that confusion. I bind that hostility. I bind that animosity. You're not dealing with people. Because you can't change people's will. But you're dealing with the forces that instigate their behavior. Are you understanding? We're not talking about witchcraft. We can't manipulate people's will. That's their choice. But you can deal with the power that's, in, that's uh, instigating them. That's influencing them. So that's why you, you deal with those things. So Paul tells us, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing uh, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And I bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Paul is talking about this with reference to how he deals with the people in the church. That's the context. So he's saying, look, I know all these things are happening in the church, but I got these weapons. And I know how to deal with these things going on in the minds of people. I can deal with this thing. So you don't go and speak to them in the face. Don't go look at them in the face and I say, I rebuke the devil. No, no. no. They won't understand you. They might send you to Nim hands, you know. Uh, don't do that. But you, in your time of prayer at home, before even you go, you say, I take authority over those thoughts, those deceptions, those lies. So you have the authority, the weapons of your warfare, by which you can deal with the things the devil is doing in the minds of people. Are you understanding? That's what you're doing. And this applies to anything. So if you have a son or a daughter who's misbehaving, going astray, deal with what the enemy is putting in their minds. You can't change their will, but you can influence their behavior by stopping what the enemy is doing in the minds. Are you understanding? You've got the right. You've got to enforce victory. Don't sit down and take it and say, oh no. I can't, I, haven't, I can't do anything about it. God says, I've given you the weapons. You destroy those strongholds. You pull down those things. You take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You enforce the victory that Christ has obtained for you. You stand your ground 
And he said, devil, not on my territory. You can go somewhere else, but not on my territory. Because I know what Jesus Christ has obtained for me. But you and I need to put up that resistance. Amen? So in your personal life, in every area of your personal life, in your future, your ministry, that's how you do it. Because the enemy is going to try to intrude, but God wants you to enforce his victory in every area of your life. And we do the same thing when we minister to other people. So let me just talk about that a little bit and then we'll close. So when you're ministering to people, the people who come to you with, with need for help, I need help in this, I need help in that. Now... Some of these problems will be very complex. And that's, you know, we're not here to unravel and solve everybody's problems. But what we can do is we can deal with the troublemaker. We can deal with the one who's causing the trouble. Are you with me so far? Because you have that authority. And they've come to you for help. You deal with the troublemaker. You can't solve all their a problem, natural problems, to deal with the enemy that's causing the problems. You teach them the truth, the word of God, and you minister with dominion and authority. What did Jesus say? What did John write about Jesus' ministry in 1 John 3, 8? He said, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Let's call our worship team up. Please come up. Jesus, the, John wrote, he said, this is the reason why Jesus came. That he might destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy it. Whatever the devil's doing, he came to destroy it. And before his ascension, this is the commission Jesus gave us in John 20 verse 21. He said, as my father has sent me, I also send you. That means you also go and destroy the works of the devil. So as believers, we've been commissioned to go destroy the works of the devil. You trouble the troublemaker. Amen. You be the devil's worst nightmare. So when somebody comes to you for help, the devil says, oh no, they've gone to the right person. <laughs> and you can do it. Because all you and I are doing is enforcing Christ's victory. It's not that we have something. We're just saying, Jesus, you want it. And I'm enforcing it here on earth. Earth. So let's before let's before we sing, I want us to make these three declarations that come up on the slide. Let's say it out loud, bold, and strong together. Let's go. Satan and all his demons have been crushed, expelled, condemned, disarmed, and destroyed. So we stand and operate boldly with a sense of complete authority and dominion over the enemy. And we enforce Christ's triumph and victory. Amen. That's who we are as believers. Jesus has finished the work. Now it's your turn to enforce the victory. In your life and in the lives of those who come to you for help. We're going to sing a very old song. You guys are ready? Okay. Uh, this song is from the 80s. Some people think contemporary music started with Hillsong. No. Before Hillsong, there was Hosanna Integrity. <laughs> and there was Maranatha Praise. <laughs> okay. And so this song comes from that generation. If you don't know, if you don't know anything about it, please learn. <laughs> so this song was, I think it's 1982. Uh, but this song really captures... Uh, the essence of what we've shared this morning. So I just request to the worship team uh, to sing this for us. So sit down, listen to the first time, and then once you've got it, we'll all stand up and sing it together. So please help us then.
Sing it together. As you stand here, you pronounce victory over your situation, your circumstance. I don't know what you might be going through, but you declare victory. You say, God, thank you that you give me victory in this situation, whatever it is. It might be a situation at home, it might be a situation at work, but you declare, Lord, I thank you that victory is mine, that you cause me to triumph, that you have won the victory for me in this circumstance, in this situation. And Lord, Father, I just pray, even now in this place, that every sickness bows, every financial distress bows, that God, you release your power into each of our lives, so that we, your people, will walk in the victory that Jesus Christ obtained for us. 
we thank you heavenly father we thank you and god use us even to minister to people that we will minister based on the finished work of christ on the cross use us father in jesus name amen 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 Before we close this morning, we want to give an opportunity for anyone here to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Bible tells us it's so important for us to believe in the person of Jesus Christ. All of us are sinners. We've sinned before God and there is no way that we can pay for our own sins. But the Bible tells us Jesus Christ came. God came into this world in the person of Christ. He died on the cross where he paid for all of our sins. He was buried and he rose up again and he's alive today. And the Bible says that if anyone receives him, to him he gives the power to become the children of God. So there's anyone here, you've never received Jesus into your heart, but this morning you would like to do that. I want to invite you to just follow me in this simple prayer. You can just say this with me. If you've never done this before, just say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sins on the cross. I believe you rose up again and you are alive today. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sins. And make me a child of God and help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Has anyone, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time this morning. We'd love to see your hands so that we can celebrate with you. Just put your hand up wherever you are. If you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time this morning, we'd just like to see your hand. Just raise your hand up high. Anyone, anywhere in this auditorium, up in the balcony. If you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time, just raise your hands. I don't see anyone. Okay. If you prayed this prayer and you received Jesus into your life, but you didn't raise your hand, on all our exits, there are greeters who are standing there with a green bag. Just tell them on your way out. I prayed this prayer and I like to receive that green bag. They will give it to you. They'll take your name and number so that we can call you and instruct you how to use that bag. Let's close, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always in Jesus' name.